Hi guys, Nadine here. So I of course forgot to change the name of the stream. So of course I almost tweeted it out, but then I didn't because it was in the middle of the thingy and ah, uh, oh well, east of the sun and west of the moon uh, is where I am. East of the sun and west of the moon. We're going to do one and two tonight. That's an hour. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> Hi, honey. <laughs> um, east of the sun and west of the moon. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. One and two. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to do this and put that in here and change this to here. And um, yeah, oh, just a sec. I'm getting there, honey. I, I see ya. I see ya. I'm just being like way disorganized. One and two. One and two. Uh, so there's other people here it looks like I'm sorry I'm just kind of filling and farting with stuff that I should have had done because I didn't think about it you know it's a professional operation here people always remember that uh, Peter Christensen uh, oh I can't even think about saying those names um, where is it? Uh, wrong spot. Okay. Wrong spot. There we go. Okay. East of the sun and west of the moon. And, um, that's saved. Uh, one to two. And I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I can't see his chat yet. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I am smart as could be because I didn't need to do this beforehand. You know, why would I want to do that? That's like being organized or something. Come on, you guys are silly. File save. Now it should say it right. And, um,. There we go. Uh, let's see new tweets. Twites. Uh, my tweets. Uh, Patience by Nadine. There. My tweets are there. Okay. And um, um, copy, share, copy link. Okay. Share. And then, um, okay. Now let's get rid of that. And let's get rid of this. And get rid of this. And get rid of that. Oh, um, don't, um, don't, don't save. Okay. <laughs> you are silly, honey. <laughs> oh, boy. 
days. <laughs> uh, now I gotta get that link shared off. <laughs> and then, um, let's see. This is probably gonna be the easiest way. Mute me. No, thank you. And, uh, nope, I don't want that. I want to share. Haha. -ha. Copy the link. In. There we go. There we go. Now, now, now we're cooking with fire. Now we're cooking with fire. It's because I'm smart and this is professional. Um, you back? Oh, you said was <laughs> just. I, <laughs> I like you too, handsome. <laughs> you are so silly. <laughs> okay, now now that I've got that out, I oh, I should show you guys what I did. I did. Um. I did the this one today at eight. Uh, yay! Now it's transparent, but and I went to play it as a background for my for my this, but it can't for this thing. It can't be it can't be played as a transparent background. Cause I was gonna have snow on me, but um, so I, I'm not sure how I would fix that. Oops, the wrong blender. Um, and the wrong blender. There we go. And where is it that it is? It is. It is over there. Okay. It is over there. Yay. So that's what I'm working on. Mm. Um So yeah, that's what I that's what I did there the other day. I got um oops, I should have pressed the button. Okay. Um open recent snowflakes so this is um uh let's see lamp zero zero oh Helps if I actually did the right thing. Zero zero and uh, eleven. And plane is well. Why is it not doing? Oh, x is zero. There we go. Aha. Uh, T and in to close those and F12 to render it. So, um, oh, mm. so this is what it looks like. Oh, uh, now what did I do? <laughs> oh, there we go. F, um, 150%. And F12. There we go. Ha ha. Reese, how you doing? This this is what I was uh, I've been working on. I made snowflakes. <laughs> and um, I made some snowy snow stuff falling down. And uh, so I made that snowflake, 
and then um, I made this one um, F12. You know, it would be nice if I actually remember to do certain things. <laughs> it goes a lot better that way. So then there's that. <laughs> I I will ask Reese. I don't know what kind of sway I would have since I'm a heathen and all, but I I can ask. I can I can smile and be all pretty. Say please. Please, please, please. That's about all I can try and do. So there's the, the other snowflakes. And then um, uh, if I go over to this one, and then I take the, um, move with that one to three, and then go over to three, and then Move that one over and did that. Uh. Okay, that's probably why. Right down too far. F12. And then, and then, of course, it would really, really, really flip and help if I remembered to do the thing again. There we go. Uh, yeah. Just don't know what I'm gonna do with myself. I don't. I don't even have a light in there. Uh, uh. Okay. Okay. I got this. I got this because I'm smart. Um. <sighs> move it to number three. Go over to hit F, change 3D view to UV editor, and go over to slot 2, F12 it, um, F12 it. Okay, so there we go. Because I'm smart, I'll eventually get it. So I did up this set of snowy flakes. I just did them up purple because I liked them. And then I did up, um, those ones are low poly. And I did up these ones. They're high poly, means they got more details. And uh, apparently Reese needs to have a debate. Needs to. Absolutely has to. And then number three. Uh, and put in number three, F12, that one. And it's amazing, we can see it. And that's super low poly is what I'm calling it. It's basically I can have more of these things in the scene.
Hit all control Jesus fix it. <laughs> um so there we go. Um that's what I've been working on. And I did up an animation. I guess were you here for it, Reese? I don't think you were. Just a second, I'm gonna show you because it was cool. Um This was the one I did up. Isn't that cool? That's like so cool. But it's transparent. But I didn't do it in the right uh, format to make it snow on top of me. I haven't figured that part out yet. I was going to make it snow on me. Cool, eh? Okay. Uh, Reese, if Josiah doesn't <laughs> talk back to you, it's because he passed out. He, the doctors gave him some more pain meds for the <laughs> for his shoulder, and he's like so fuzzy right now. It's it's not even funny. It's hilarious. Um, but here, okay, we'll play the, we'll play the book, uh, it's, um, East of the Sun and West of the Moon, and of course, Hans requested it, but he's not here because that's just kind of what happens. He doesn't show up on the Thursday ones so much because, uh, or the Tuesday night ones so much because it's like 1 a.m. or something over there. Try to wait around, see if he's showing up. Where is it? Where is it though? Okay. Oh, before I forget, I'm not. I'm going to mute myself so that I don't get all that feedback. Just a second here. Um, mute. Preface of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Magdalena Cook. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christian Espionson and Jörn Engebretsen Mo. Translated by George Webb Descent. Section O. Preface. A folk tale, in its primitive plainness of word and entire absence of complexity and thought, is peculiarly sensitive and susceptible to the touch of stranger hands. And he who has been able to acquaint himself with the Norsk folk event of Espionson and Mo, from which these stories are selected, has an advantage over the reader of an English rendering. Of this advantage, Mr. K. Nielsen has fully availed himself, and the exquisite bizarrery of his drawings aptly expresses the innermost significance of the old world old wives fables for to term these legends nursery tales would be to curtail them by nine-tenths of their interest they are the romances of the childhood of nations they are the never-failing springs of sentiment of sensation of heroic example from which primeval peoples drink their fill at will the quaintness the tenderness the grotesque yet realistic intermingling of actuality with supernaturalism by which the original Norsk Felkeventer are characterized will make an appeal to all, as represented in the pictures of K. Nielsen, and these imperishable traditions whose bases are among the very roots of all antiquity are here reincarnated in line and colour, to the delight of all whoever knew or now shall know them. Permission to reprint the stories in this book, which originally appeared in Sir G. W. Descent's Popular Tales from the Norse, has been obtained from Mrs. George Rutledge and Sons Limited. Section. The Three Princesses in the Blue Mountain is printed by arrangement with Mrs. David Nutt, and Prince Lindworm is newly translated for this volume. End of preface. Section 1 of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Leonard Wilson. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen Esbjörnsen and Jörn Engebretsen Mo. Translated by George Webb Dassent. Section 1 East of the Sun and West of the Moon. Once on a time there was a poor husbandman who had so many children that he hadn't much of either food or clothing to give them pretty children they all were but the prettiest was the youngest daughter who was so lovely there was no end to her loveliness so one day twas on a thursday evening late at the fall of the year the weather was so wild and rough outside and it was so cruelly dark and rain fell and wind blew till the walls of the cottage shook again there they all sat round the fire busy with this thing and that but just then all at once something gave three taps on the window-pane then the father went out to see what was the matter and when he got out of doors what should he see but a great big white bear good evening to you said the white bear the same to you said the man will you give me your youngest daughter if you will i'll make you as rich as you are now poor said the bear well the man would not be at all sorry to be so rich but still he thought he must have a bit of a talk with his daughter first so he went in and told them how there was a great white bear waiting outside who had given his word to make them so rich if he could only have the youngest daughter the lassie said no outright nothing could get her to say anything else so the man went out and settled it with the white bear that he should come again the next thursday evening and get an answer meantime he talked his daughter over and kept on telling her of all the riches they would get and how well off she would be herself and so at last she thought better of it and washed and mended her rags made herself as smart as she could and was ready to start i can't say her packing gave her much trouble next thursday evening came the white bear to fetch her and she got upon his back with her bundle and off they went so when they had gone a bit of the way the white bear said are you afraid no she wasn't well mind and hold tight by my shaggy coat and then there's nothing to fear said the bear so she rode a long long way till they came to a great steep hill there on the face of it the white bear gave a knock and a door opened and they came into a castle where there were many rooms all lit up rooms gleaming with silver and gold and there too was a table ready laid and it was all as grand as grand could be then the white bear gave her a silver bell and when she wanted anything she was only to ring it and she would get it at once well after she had eaten and drunk and evening wore on she got sleepy after her journey and thought she would like to go to bed so she rang the bell and she had scarce taken hold of it before she came into a chamber where there was a bed made as fair and white as any one would wish to sleep in with silken pillows and curtains and gold fringe all that was in the room was gold or silver but when she had gone to bed and put out the light a man came and laid himself alongside her that was the white bear who threw off his beast shape at night but she never saw him for he always came after she had put out the light and before the day dawned he was up and off again so things went on happily for a while but at last she began to get silent and sorrowful for there she went about all day alone and she longed to go home to see her father and mother and brothers and sisters so one day when the white bear asked what it was that she lacked she said it was so dull and lonely there 
and how she longed to go home to see her father and mother and brothers and sisters and that was why she was so sad and sorrowful because she couldn't get to them well well said the bear perhaps there's a cure for all this but you must promise me one thing not to talk alone with your mother but only when the rest are by to hear for she'll take you by the hand and try to lead you into a room alone to talk but you must mind and not do that else you'll bring bad luck on both of us so one sunday the white bear came and said now they could set off to see her father and mother well off they started she sitting on his back and they went far and long at last they came to a grand house and there her brothers and sisters were running about out of doors at play and everything was so pretty twas a joy to see this is where your father and mother live now said the white bear but don't forget what i told you else you'll make us both unlucky no bless her she'd not forget and when she had reached the house the white bear turned right about and left her then when she went in to see her father and mother there was such joy there was no end to it none of them thought they could thank her enough for all she had done for them now they had everything they wished as good as good could be and they all wanted to know how she got on where she lived well she said it was very good to live where she did she had all she wished what she said beside i don't know but i don't think any of them had the right end of the stick or that they got much out of her but so in the afternoon after they had done dinner all happened as the white bear had said her mother wanted to talk with her alone in her bedroom but she minded what the white bear had said and wouldn't go upstairs oh what we have to talk about will keep she said and put her mother off but somehow or other her mother got round her at last and she had to tell her the whole story so she said how every night when she had gone to bed a man came and lay down beside her as soon as she had put out the light and how she never saw him because he was always up and away before the morning dawned and how she went about woeful and sorrowing for she thought she should so like to see him and how all day long she walked about there alone and how dull and dreary and lonesome it was my said her mother it may well be a troll you slept with but now i'll teach you a lesson how to set eyes on him i'll give you a bit of candle which you can carry home in your bosom just light that while he is asleep but take care not to drop the tallow on him yes she took the candle and hid it in her bosom and as night drew on the white bear came and fetched her away but when they had gone a bit of the way the white bear asked if all hadn't happened as he had said well she couldn't say it hadn't now mind said he if you have listened to your mother's advice you have brought bad luck on us both and then all that has passed between us will be as nothing no she said she hadn't listened to her mother's advice so when she reached home and had gone to bed it was the old story over again there came a man and lay down beside her but at dead of night when she heard he slept she got up and struck a light lit the candle and let the light shine on him and so she saw that he was the loveliest prince one ever set eyes on and she fell so deep in love with him on the spot that she thought she couldn't live if she didn't give him a kiss there and then and so she did but as she kissed him she dropped three hot drops of tallow on his shirt and he woke up what have you done he cried now you have made us both unlucky for had you held out only this one year i had been freed for i have a stepmother who has bewitched me so that i am a white bear by day and a man by night but now all ties are snapped between us now i must set off from you to her 
she lives in a castle which stands east of the sun and west of the moon and there too is a princess with a nose three ells long and she's the wife i must have now she wept and took it ill but there was no help for it go he must then she asked if she mightn't go with him no she mightn't tell me the way she said and i'll search you out that surely i may get leave to do yes she might do that he said but there was no way to that place it lay east of the sun and west of the moon and thither she'd never find her way so next morning when she woke up both prince and castle were gone and then she lay on a little green patch in the midst of the gloomy thick wood and by her side lay the same bundle of rags she had brought with her from her old home so when she had rubbed the sleep out of her eyes and wept till she was tired she set out on her way and walked many many days till she came to a lofty crag under it sat an old hag and played with a gold apple which she tossed about here the lassie asked if she knew the way to the prince who lived with his stepmother in the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon and who was to marry the princess with a nose three ells long how did you come to know about him asked the old hag but maybe you are the lassie who ought to have had him yes she was so so it's you is it said the old hag well all i know about him is that he lives in the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon and thither you'll come late or never but still you may have the loan of my horse and on him you can ride to my next neighbor maybe she'll be able to tell you and when you get there just give the horse a switch under the left ear and beg him to be off home and stay this gold apple you may take with you so she got upon the horse and rode a long long time till she came to another crag under which sat another old hag with a gold carding comb here the lassie asked if she knew the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon and she answered like the first old hag that she knew nothing about it except it was east of the sun and west of the moon and thither you'll come late or never but you shall have the loan of my horse to my next neighbor maybe she'll tell you all about it and when you get there just switch the horse under the left ear and beg him to be off home and this old hag gave her the golden carding comb it might be she'd find some use for it she said so the lassie got up on the horse and rode a far far way and a weary time and so at last she came to another great crag under which sat another old hag spinning with a golden spinning wheel her too she asked if she knew the way to the prince and where the castle was that lay east of the sun and west of the moon so it was the same thing over again maybe it's you who ought to have had the prince said the old hag yes it was but she too didn't know the way a bit better than the other two east of the sun and west of the moon it was she knew and that was all and thither you come late or never but i'll lend you my horse and then i think you best ride to the east wind and ask him maybe he knows those parts and can blow you thither but when you get to him you need only give the horse a switch under the left ear and he'll trot home of himself and so too she gave her the gold spinning wheel maybe you'll find a use for it said the old hag then on she rode many many days a weary time before she got to the east wind's house but at last she did reach it and then she asked the east wind if he could tell her the way to the prince 
who dwelt east of the sun and west of the moon yes the east wind had often heard tell of it the prince and the castle but he couldn't tell the way for he had never blown so far but if you will i'll go with you to a brother the west wind maybe he knows for he's much stronger so if you will just get on my back i'll carry you thither yes she got on his back and i should think they went briskly along so when they got there they went into the west wind's house and the east wind said the lassie he had brought was the one who ought to have had the prince who lived in the castle east of the sun and west of the moon and so she had set out to seek him and how he had come with her and would be glad to know if the west wind knew how to get to the castle nay said the west wind so far i've never blown but if you will i'll go with you to our brother the south wind for he's much stronger than either of us and he has flapped his wings far and wide maybe he'll tell you you can get on my back and i'll carry you to him yes she got on his back and so they travelled to the south wind and weren't so very long on the way i should think when they got there the west wind asked him if he could tell her the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon for it was she who ought to have had the prince who lived there you don't say so that's she is it said the south wind well i have blustered about in most places in my time but so far have i never blown but if you will i'll take you to my brother the north wind he is the oldest and strongest of the whole lot of us and if he don't know where it is you'll never find anyone in the world to tell you you can get on my back and i'll carry you thither yes she got on his back and away he went from his house at a fine rate and this time too she wasn't long on her way so when they got to the north wind's house he was so wild and cross cold puffs came from him a long way off blast you both what do you want he roared out to them ever so far off so that it struck them with an icy shiver well said the south wind you needn't be so foul-mouthed for here i am your brother the south wind and here is the lassie who ought to have had the prince who dwells in the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon and now she wants to ask you if you ever were there and can tell her the way for she would be so glad to find him again yes i know well enough where it is said the north wind once in my life i blew an aspen leaf thither but i was so tired i couldn't blow a puff for ever so many days after but if you really wish to go thither and aren't afraid to come along with me i'll take you on my back and see if i can blow you thither yes with all her heart she must and would get thither if it were possible in any way and as for fear however madly he went she wouldn't be at all afraid very well then said the north wind but you must sleep here to-night for we must have the whole day before us if we're to get thither at all early next morning the north wind woke her and puffed himself up and blew himself out and made himself so stout and big twas gruesome to look at him and so off they went high up through the air as if they would never stop till they got to the world's end down here below there was such a storm it threw down long tracts of wood and many houses and when it swept over the great sea ships foundered by hundreds so they tore on and on no one can believe how far they went and all the while they still went over the sea 
and the north wind got more and more weary and so out of breath he could scarce bring out a puff and his wings drooped and drooped till at last he sunk so low that the crests of the waves dashed over his heels are you afraid said the north wind no she wasn't but they weren't very far from land and the north wind had still so much strength left in him that he managed to throw her up on the shore under the windows of the castle which lay east of the sun and west of the moon but then he was so weak and worn out he had to stay there and rest many days before he could get home again next morning the lassie sat down under the castle window and began to play with the gold apple and the first person she saw was the long nose who was to have the prince what do you want for your gold apple you lassie said the long nose and threw up the window it's not for sale for gold or money said the lassie if it's not for sale or for gold or money what is it that you will sell it for you may name your own price said the princess well if i may get to the prince who lives here and be with him to-night you shall have it said the lassie whom the north wind had brought yes she might that could be done so the princess got the gold apple but when the lassie came up to the prince's bedroom at night he was fast asleep she called him and shook him and between whiles she wept sore but all she could do she couldn't wake him up next morning as soon as day broke came the princess with the long nose and drove her out again so in the daytime she sat down under the castle windows and began to card with her carding comb and the same thing happened the princess asked what she wanted for it and she said it wasn't for sale for gold or money but if she might get leave to go up to the prince and be with him that night the princess should have it but when she went up she found him fast asleep again and all she called and all she shook and wept and prayed she couldn't get life into him and as soon as the first gray peep of dawn came then came the princess with the long nose and chased her out again so in the daytime the lassie sat down outside under the castle window and began to spin with her golden spinning wheel and that too the princess with the long nose wanted to have so she threw up the window and asked what she wanted for it the lassie said as she had said twice before it wasn't for sale for gold or money but if she might go up to the prince who was there and be with him alone that night she might have it yes she might do that and welcome but now you must know there were some christian folk who had been carried off thither and as they sat in their room which was next the prince they had heard how a woman had been in there and wept and prayed and called to him two nights running and they told that to the prince that evening when the princess came with her sleepy drink the prince made as if he drank but threw it over his shoulder for he could guess it was a sleepy drink so when the lassie came in she found the prince wide awake and then she told him the whole story how she had come thither ah oh, said the prince you've just come in the very nick of time for to-morrow is to be our wedding day but now i won't have the long nose and you are the only woman in the world who can set me free i'll say i want to see what my wife is fit for and beg her to wash the shirt which has the three spots of tallow on it she'll say yes for she doesn't know tis you who put them there but that's a work only for christian folk and not for such a pack of trolls and so i'll say that i won't have any other for my bride than the woman who can wash them out and ask you to do it so there was great joy and love between them all that night but next day when the wedding was to be the prince said first of all i'd like to see what my bride is fit for uh, yes said the stepmother with all her heart well said the prince i've got a fine shirt which i'd like for my wedding shirt but somehow or other it has got three spots of tallow on it which i must have washed out 
and i have sworn never to take any other bride than the woman who's able to do that if she can't she's not worth having well that was no great thing they said so they agreed and she with the long nose began to wash away as hard as she could but the more she rubbed and scrubbed the bigger the spots grew ah said the old hag her mother you can't wash let me try but she hadn't long taken the shirt in hand before it got far worse than ever and with all her rubbing and wringing and scrubbing the spots grew bigger and blacker and the darker and uglier was the shirt then all the other trolls began to wash but the longer it lasted the blacker and uglier the shirt grew till at last it was as black all over as if it had been up the chimney ah oh, said the prince you're none of you worth a straw you can't wash why there outside sits a beggar lassie i'll be bound she knows how to wash better than the whole lot of you come in lassie he shouted well in she came can you wash this shirt clean lassie you said he i don't know she said but i think i can and almost before she had taken it and dipped it in the water it was as white as driven snow and whiter still yes you are the lassie for me said the prince at that the old hag flew into such a rage she burst on the spot and the princess with the long nose after her and the whole pack of trolls after her at least i've never heard a word about them since as for the prince and princess they set free all the poor christian folk who had been carried off and shut up there and they took with them all the silver and gold and flitted away as far as they could from the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon end of section one east of the sun and west of the moon recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Two of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Xu Shan. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen Asbjornsen and Jern Engebretsen Moe. Translated by George Webb Descent. Section 2. The Blue Belt. Once on a time there was an old beggar woman who had gone out to beg. She had a little lad with her, and when she had got her bag full she struck across the hills towards her own home. So when they had gone a bit up the hillside they came upon a little blue belt, which lay where two paths met and the lad asked his mother's leave to pick it up. No, said she, maybe there's witchcraft in it. And so with threat she forced him to follow her. But when they had gone a bit further, the lad said he must turn aside a moment out of the road, and meanwhile his mother sat down on a tree stump. But the lad was a long time gone, for as soon as he got so far into the wood that the old dame could not see him, he ran off to where the belt lay, took it up, tied it round his waist, and, lo, he felt as strong as if he could lift the whole hill. When he got back, the old dame was in a great rage, and wanted to know what he had been doing all that while. "'You don't care how much time you waste,' and yet you know the night is drawing on, and we must cross the hill before it is dark. So on they tramped. But when they had got about half way, the old dame grew weary, and said she must rest under a bush. Dear mother, said the lad, mayn't I just go up to the top of this high crag while you rest, and try if I can't see some sign of folk hereabouts? Yes, he might do that. So when he had got to the top, he saw a light shining from the north. So he ran down and told his mother, We must get on, mother. We are near a house, for I see a bright light shining quite close to us in the north. Then she rose and shouldered her bag and set off to see. 
but they hadn't gone far before there stood a steep spur on the hill right across their path. "'Just as I thought,' said the old dame. "'Now we can't go a step farther. A pretty bed we shall have here.' But the lad took the bag under one arm, and his mother under the other, and ran straight up the steep crag with them. "'Now, don't you see? Don't you see that we are close to a house? Don't you see that bright light?' But the old dame said those were no Christian folk, but trolls, for she was at home in all that forest far and near, and knew there was not a living soul in it, until you were well over the ridge and had come down on the other side. But they went on, and in a little while they came to a great house which was all painted red. "'What's the good?' said the old dame. "'We daren't go in, for here the trolls live.' "'Don't say so. We must go in. There must be men where the lights shine so,' said the lad. So in he went, and his mother after him. But he had scarce opened the door before she swooned away for there she saw a great stout man, at least twenty feet high, sitting on the bench. "'Good evening, grandfather,' said the lad. "'Well, here I've sat three hundred years,' said the man who sat on the bench, "'and no one has ever come and called me grandfather before.' Then the lad sat down by the man's side, and began to talk to him as if they had been old friends. "'But what's come over your mother?' said the man, after they had chatted a while. "'I think she swooned away. You had better look after her.' So the lad went and took hold of the old dame, and dragged her up the hall along the floor. That brought her to herself, and she kicked and scratched and flung herself about, and at last sat down upon a heap of firewood in the corner. But she was so frightened that she scarce dared to look one in the face. After a while the lad asked if they could spend the night there. "'Yes, to be sure,' said the man. So they went on talking again, but the lad soon got hungry and wanted to know if they could get food as well as lodging. "'Of course,' said the man. "'That might be got too.' And after he had sat a while longer— he rose up and threw six loads of dry pitch pine on the fire. This made the old hag still more afraid. "'Oh, now he's going to roast us alive,' she said in the corner where she sat. And when the wood had burned down to glowing embers, up got the man and strode out of his house. "'Heaven bless and help us! What a stout heart you have got!' said the old dame. "'Don't you see we have got amongst trolls?' "'Stuff and nonsense,' said the lad. "'No harm if we have.' In a little while back came the man with an ox so fat and big the lad had never seen its like, and he gave it one blow with his fist under the ear, and down it fell dead on the floor. When that was done he took it up by all the four legs and laid it on the glowing embers and turned it and twisted it about till it was burnt brown outside. After that he went to a cupboard and took out a great silver dish and laid the ox on it, and the dish was so big that none of the ox hung over on any side. This he put on the table, and then he went down into the cellar and fetched a cask of wine, knocked out the head, and put the cask on the table together with two knives which were each six feet long. When this was done, he bade them go and sit down to supper and eat. So they went, the lad first and the old dame after. But she began to whimper and wail, and to wonder how she should ever use such knives. But her son seized one, and began to cut slices out of the thigh of the ox, which he placed before his mother. And when they had eaten a bit, he took up the cask with both hands, and lifted it down to the floor. Then he told his mother to come and drink, but it was still so high she couldn't reach up to it. So he caught her up, and held her up to the edge of the cask while she drank. 
As for himself, he clambered up and hung down like a cat inside the cask while he drank. So when he had quenched his thirst, he took up the cask and put it back on the table, and thanked the man for the good meal, and told his mother to come and thank him too, and afeard though she was, she dared do nothing else but thank the man. Then the lad sat down again alongside the man and began to gossip, and after they had sat a while the man said, "'Well, I must just go and get a bit of supper too.' And so he went to the table and ate up the whole ox, hoofs and horns and all, and drained the cask to the last drop, and then went back and sat on the bench. "'As for beds,' he said, "'I don't know what's to be done. I've only got one bed and a cradle. But we could get on pretty well if you would sleep in the cradle, and then your mother might lie in the bed yonder.' "'Thank you kindly. That'll do nicely,' said the lad. And with that he pulled off his clothes and lay down in the cradle. But to tell you the truth, it was quite as big as a four-poster. As for the old dame, she had to follow the man who showed her to bed, though she was out of her wits for fear. "'Well,' thought the lad to himself, "'twill never do to go to sleep yet. I'd best lie awake and listen how things go as the night wears on.' So, after a while, the man began to talk to the old dame, and at last he said, "'We two might live here so happily together.' "'Could we only be rid of this son of yours?' "'But do you know how to settle him? "'Is that what you're thinking of?' said she. "'Nothing easier,' said he. "'At any rate, he would try. "'He would just say he wished the old dame would stay "'and keep house for him a day or two, "'and then he would take the lad out with him "'up the hill to quarry cornerstones "'and roll down a great rock on him.' All this the lad lay and listened to. Next day the troll, for it was a troll as clear as day, asked if the old dame would stay and keep house for him a few days, and as the day went on he took a great iron crowbar, and asked the lad if he had a mind to go with him up the hill and quarry a few cornerstones. With all his heart, he said, and went with him. And so, after they had split a few stones, the troll wanted him to go down below and look after cracks in the rock. And while he was doing this, the troll worked away, and wearied himself with his crowbar till he moved a whole crag out of its bed, which came rolling right down on the place where the lad was. But he held it up till he could get on one side and then let it roll on. "'Oh!' said the lad to the troll. "'Now I see what you mean to do with me. "'You want to crush me to death. "'So just go down yourself and look after the cracks and refts in the rock, "'and I'll stand up above.' "'The troll did not dare to do otherwise than the lad bade him, "'and the end of it was that the lad rolled down a great rock "'which fell upon the troll and broke one of his thighs. "'Well, you are in a sad plight.' said the lad, as he strode down, lifted up the rock, and set the man free. After that he had to put him on his back and carry him home. So he ran with him as fat as a horse, and shook him so that the troll screamed and screeched as if a knife were run into him. And when he got home they had to put the troll to bed, and there he lay in a sad pickle. When the night wore on the troll began to talk to the old dame again, and to wonder how ever they could be rid of the lad. "'Well,' said the old dame, "'if you can't hit on a plan to get rid of him, I'm sure I can't.' "'Let me see,' said the troll. "'I've got twelve lions in a garden. If they could only get hold of the lad, they'd soon tear him to pieces.' So the old dame said it would be easy enough to get him there. She would sham sick, and say she felt so poorly nothing would do her any good but lion's milk. All that the lad lay and listened to, and when he got up in the morning his mother said she was worse than she looked, and she thought she should never be right again unless she could get some lion's milk. "'Then I'm afraid you'll be poorly a long time, mother,' 
said the lad, "'for I'm sure I don't know where any is to be got.' "'Oh, if that be all,' said the troll, "'there's no lack of lion's milk if we only had the man to fetch it.' And then he went on to say how his brother had a garden with twelve lions in it, and how the lad might have the key if he had a mind to milk the lions. So the lad took the key and a milking pail and strode off. And when he unlocked the gate and got into the garden, there stood all the twelve lions on their hind paws, rampant and roaring at him. But the lad laid hold of the biggest, and led him about by the four paws, and dashed him against stalks and stones till there wasn't a bit of him left but the two paws. So when the rest saw that, they were so afraid that they crept up and lay at his feet like so many curs. After that, they followed him about wherever he went, and when he got home, they lay down outside the house with their forepaws on the door sill. "'Now, mother, you'll soon be well,' said the lad when he went in, "'for here is the lion's milk.' He had just milked a drop in the pail. But the troll, as he lay in bed, swore it was all a lie. He was sure the lad was not the man to milk lions." When the lad heard that, he forced the troll to get out of bed, threw open the door, and all the lions rose up and seized the troll, and at last the lad had to make them leave their hold. That night the troll began to talk to the old dame again. "'I'm sure I can't tell how to put this lad out of the way. He is so awfully strong. Can't you think of some way?' "'No,' said the old dame. "'If you can't tell, I'm sure I can't.' "'Well,' said the troll, "'I have two brothers in a castle. "'They are twelve times as strong as I am, "'and that's why I was turned out "'and had to put up with this farm. "'They hold that castle, "'and round it there is an orchard with apples in it, "'and whoever eats those apples "'sleeps for three days and three nights. "'If we could only get the lad to go for the fruit,' He wouldn't be able to keep from tasting the apples, and as soon as ever he fell asleep, my brothers would tear him in pieces. The old dame said she would sham sick, and say she could never be herself again unless she tasted those apples, for she had set her heart on them. All this the lad lay and listened to. When the morning came, the old dame was so poorly that she couldn't utter a word but groans and sighs. She was sure she should never be well again, unless she had some of those apples that grew in the orchard near the castle where the man's brothers lived. Only she had no one to send for them. Oh, the lad was ready to go that instant, but the eleven lions went with him. So when he came to the orchard, he climbed up into the apple tree, and ate as many apples as he could, and he had scarce got down before he fell into a deep sleep but the lions all lay round him in a ring. The third day came the troll's brothers, but they did not come in man-shape. They came snorting like man-eating steeds, and wondered who it was that dared to be there, and said they would tear him to pieces so small that there should not be a bit of him left. But up rose the lions and tore the trolls into small pieces, so that the place looked as if a dung-heap had been tossed about it. And when they had finished the trolls, they lay down again. The lad did not wake till late in the afternoon, and when he got on his knees and rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, he began to wonder what had been going on, when he saw the marks of hooves. But when he went towards the castle, a maiden looked out of a window who had seen all that had happened, and she said, "'You may thank your stars you weren't in that tussle, else you must have lost your life.' "'What? I lose my life? No fear of that, I think,' said the lad. So she begged him to come in, that she might talk with him, for she hadn't seen a Christian soul ever since she came there. But when she opened the door the lions wanted to go in too, but she got so frightened that she began to scream, and so the lad let them lie outside.' Then the two talked and talked, and the lad asked how it came that she, who was so lovely, could put up with those ugly trolls. She never wished it, she said. Twas quite against her will. 
They had seized her by force, and she was the king of Arabia's daughter. So they talked on, and at last she asked him what he would do, whether she should go back home, or whether he would have her to wife. Of course he would have her, and she shouldn't go home. After that they went round the castle, and at last they came to a great hall where the troll's two great swords hung high up on the wall. "'I wonder if you are man enough to wield one of these,' said the princess. "'Who? I?' said the lad. "'Twould be a pretty thing if I couldn't wield one of these.' With that he put two or three chairs one atop of the other, jumped up, and touched the biggest sword with his finger-tips, tossed it up in the air, and caught it again by the hilt, leapt down, and at the same time dealt such a blow with it on the floor that the whole hall shook. After he had thus got down, he thrust the sword under his arm and carried it about with him. So, when they had lived a little while in the castle, the princess thought she ought to go home to her parents and let them know what had become of her. So they loaded a ship, and she set sail from the castle. After she had gone, and the lad had wandered about a little, he called to mind that he had been sent out on an errand thither, and had come to fetch something for his mother's health, and though he said to himself, After all, the old dame was not so bad, but she's all right by this time, still he thought he ought to go and just see how she was. So he went, and found both the man and his mother quite fresh and hearty. "'What wretches you are to live in this beggarly hut,' said the lad. "'Come with me up to my castle, and you shall see what a fine fellow I am.' Well, they were both ready to go, and on the way his mother talked to him, and asked how it was he had got so strong. "'If you must know, it came of that blue belt which lay on the hillside that time when you and I were out begging,' said the lad. "'Have you got it still?' asked she. Yes, he had. It was tied round his waist. Might she see it? Yes, she might, and with that he pulled open his waistcoat and shirt to show it to her. Then she seized it with both hands, tore it off, and twisted it round her fist. Now, she cried, what shall I do with such a wretch as you? I'll just give you one blow and dash your brains out. Far too good a death for such a scamp said the troll. No, let's first burn out his eyes, and then turn him adrift in a little boat. So they burned out his eyes, and turned him adrift, in spite of his prayers and tears. But as the boat drifted, the lion swam after, and at last they laid hold of it, and dragged it ashore on an island, and placed the lad under a fir-tree. They caught game for him, and they plucked the birds, and made him a bed of down. But he was forced to eat his meat raw, and he was blind. At last, one day, the biggest lion was chasing a hare which was blind, for it ran straight over stock and stone, and the end was, it ran right up against a fir stump, and tumbled head over heels across the field right into a spring. But lo! when it came out of the spring, it saw its way quite plain, and so saved its life. So, sure, so, sure, thought the lion, and went and dragged the lad to the spring, and dipped him over head and ears in it. So, when he had got his sight again, he went down to the shore and made signs to the lions that they should all lie close together like a raft. Then he stood upon their backs while they swam with him to the mainland. When he had reached the shore, he went up into a birchen copse and made the lions lie quiet. Then he stole up to the castle like a thief, to see if he couldn't lay hands on his belt. And when he got to the door, he peeped through the keyhole, and there he saw his belt hanging up over a door in the kitchen. So he crept softly in across the floor, for there was no one there. But as soon as he had got hold of the belt, he began to kick and stamp about as though he were mad. Just then his mother came rushing out. "'Dear heart, my darling little boy, do give me the belt again,' she said. "'Thank you kindly,' said he. "'Now you shall have the doom you passed on me.' And he fulfilled it on the spot. When the old troll heard that, he came in and begged and prayed so prettily that he might not be smitten to death. "'Well, you may live,' said the lad. 
but you shall undergo the same punishment you gave me. And so he burned out the troll's eyes, and turned him adrift on the sea in a little boat, but he had no lions to follow him. Now the lad was all alone, and he went about longing and longing for the princess. At last he could bear it no longer. He must set out to seek her. His heart was so bent on having her. So he loaded four ships and set sail for Arabia. For some time they had fair wind and fine weather, but after that they lay wind-bound under a rocky island. So the sailors went ashore and strolled about to spend the time, and there they found a huge egg, almost as big as a little house. So they began to knock it about with large stones, but, after all, they couldn't crack the shell. Then the lad came up with his sword to see what all the noise was about, and when he saw the egg he thought it a trifle to crack it. So he gave it one blow, and the egg split, and out came a chicken as big as an elephant. "'Now we have done wrong,' said the lad. "'This can cost us all our lives.' And then he asked his sailors if they were men enough to sail to Arabia in four and twenty hours if they got a fine breeze. Yes, they were good to do that, they said. So they set sail with a fine breeze, and got to Arabia in three and twenty hours. As soon as they landed, the lad ordered all the sailors to 